I know that if I invest in Sydney, the likelihood of preserving my capital and getting my money back is very, very high. If I was to invest in WeWar, a dying small town in regional New South Wales, the idea of me getting my money back is far more risky. So certainly when it comes to regional communities, the smaller you go, the more volatile your risk is. Welcome to the Urban Property Investor. I'm your host, Sam Saggers, here to help you crack the code of real estate wealth. Today's show, we're doing battle. Yes, we're going to dig into regional versus urban. Well, actually, we're going to dig into how to understand where good regional markets are. And yes, we'll compare them to urban. I am, after all, identifying as an urban property investor. However, in this uh, day of wokeness, maybe I should identify as a regional property investor. Who knows? Let's try and crack that code. I hope everyone is well. Welcome back, regulars. You know the drill. Play the program in double speed. Get your life back. And of course, uh, if it's your first time tuning in, Wow, you found podcast heaven uh, here at the Urban Property Investor. We talk about real estate. We teach real estate. In fact, most of my podcasts are lessons on real estate. So feel free to check out some past episodes and get some lessons on real estate. I hope everyone is well. I'm freezing. I'm dressed like the Michelin Man. I don't know if the Michelin Man still exists. I feel like the Michelin Man. I'm in the puffer. I'm podcasting under uh, a puffer jacket. So I don't even know if it's like, I don't know, every time I move it makes a squishy sound. So hopefully that's not coming through on the microphone. A podcast and squishiness probably doesn't uh, gel. But hey, this podcast today is actually brought to you by one of the listeners of the show who has sort of reached out and uh, kind of mentioned that they would like to hear a little bit about the regional world, even though I am identifying as the urban property investor. So uh, shout out to, uh, to all the listeners who do write in and give me some feedback and give me some ideas on shows. Uh, certainly it helps when it comes to show planning, if you've got some ideas that you want me to to tackle, I'm very happy to do that because uh, just DM me and I will do my best to, uh, to come up with a show that uh, maybe fits your brief. Um, there is so much to talk about in real estate and certainly... I don't mind when a few people come up with a few ideas for themselves, which is great. Um, so today we're going to dig into the regional economies. We're going to dig into what's good about regional economies and, of course, uh, what you need to be mindful of if you are investing in the regions. And, of course, uh, Jack Nicholson Yes, not the actor, but Jack from Shepparton has uh, has reached out and asked about today's show. So I think on today's show, we're going to have to cover off a lot of stuff, Jack and listeners. We're going to have to cover off the idea of economics, the types of regionals that people can actually invest in, and of course, risks and opportunities, which are uh, plenty in the real estate marketplace. So it should be a good show. Uh, let's get into it. So I guess the big question looms when it comes to any type of investment, where should you move your money? And uh, as you guys know, I teach a four quadrant model of how to invest 
Uh, those quadrants effectively are capital preservation, growth, yield, and tax. And of course, capital preservation is a big part of the conversation when it comes to investment. I know that if I invest in Sydney, the likelihood of preserving my capital and getting my money back is very, very high. If I was to invest in WeWar, a dying small town in regional New South Wales, the idea of me getting my money back is far more risky. So certainly when it comes to regional communities, the smaller you go, the more volatile your risk is. And of course, I always teach what is known as my five properties in five locations plan, sometimes known as the five cities plan. I think to become a successful property investor, you need to use leverage to pay off debt. So in that vein, if you own your own home and you are able to put another four properties into your portfolio, along with your own home, you would have five properties. If you were to spread those five properties across Australia, you would have a very diverse portfolio. Uh, of the four properties which are investments, if they all go up in value, you can effectively use two of the four properties to uh, get sold and use that leverage capital gain to pay off the debt on the other two and use them to be your retirement properties. So there's a lot in that framework. And of course, your retirement properties need to be in safe locations because obviously you will call upon them in your retirement. They also need to be in areas which are going to provide sustainable tenant uh, income and uh, income that's going to grow alongside the profile of uh, the right socioeconomics. So in urban areas, there are some terrible places. Not every urban area in Sydney is good. In fact, there are pockets which are just would make terrible investments. And of course, a regional investment would outperform terrible parts of Sydney. But in general, if we were to propose that we will use my Forex growth plan to buy real estate, Remember, my Forex growth plan is really simple as well. We want to make some money on the way in, perhaps haggle a good price or add value to the real estate, do a little reno, maybe do a build. Um, we've got to add some value to the real estate. We're going to choose a good location. Location is, is paramount to capital growth. A good street, uh, maybe a nice property close to the shops, a good suburb with a good socioeconomic profile. Then we want, obviously, a marketplace, which is full of pie, population, infrastructure, and economics, or employment. And uh, we want differentiators on the property. Now, the Forex growth plan could be used in a smaller regional marketplace. It simply would not be useful in a small town, which is basically... Uh, dying. You couldn't go to Kulgadi in the middle of the desert and use my Forex growth plan. So remember, cities have rankings. We have two global cities in Australia, Sydney and Melbourne. They're global brands. People know them wherever you're traveling in the world. Uh, people understand them. We have two new world cities, Perth and Brisbane. Brisbane, of course, is on the world stage for the 2032 Olympic Games. New world cities are effectively called new world cities because they attract a lot of new industry. A lot of companies move there to start their headquarters, a lot of startups, a lot of innovation, and they really drive the backbone of those cities. And then, of course, we've got our sort of state capitals, you know, your Hobarts, your uh, your Adelaide's, uh, your, uh, your, um, your, and even places like Canberra, which um, again are just really safe places to invest. Capital preservation, you, you should get your money back if you use my Forex growth plan. And of course, then we've got our feeder cities. And feeder cities to me are tremendous regional marketplaces. 
places like Toowoomba, Wollongong, Geelong, the Gold Coast, Newcastle, these all feed into your more global or new world cities, the Sunshine Coast. Uh, and they're within a short drive, really, from those cities. And so feeder cities are identified as regional marketplaces. Now, I invest in feeder cities. I think they're great investment regional marketplaces. They get a lot of outflow from the more primary city, um, and they really could, uh, can get a benefit from certain types of economics bouncing out of places like Sydney, Melbourne, Brisbane, Perth. So by way of example, I invest in Newcastle, which is a feeder city to Sydney. I also invest in Sydney. Uh, I look for the right lifestyle balance in both marketplaces, and I've done well in both marketplaces. Then we've got sort of our major regional sort of hubs, if you like, your places like your Cairns, um, you've got uh, in Victoria, you've got um, thing, cities like Bendigo, and uh, they're quite sizable regional cities. And then we go down to more your regional town centres, your Port Macquarie's, your Coffs Harbours. Uh, and then really below that, you, you probably don't want to leave major regional town centres and go into your much smaller townships, uh, your places like uh, your Morees, your Wee Wars, your Broken Hills, your your Coolgardies. They they are they are marketplaces which would carry a lot of volatility. Now, as a property investor, volatility is something you're going to have to deal with because of price. If you're a property investor and you can spend a million dollars, one point five, you can really get to clear air. It's like being in an aircraft going through the clouds, being a property investor at times. Um, you know, as you take off, you go through the clouds, there's a lot of turbulence. When you break through the clouds on an aeroplane, you find that clear air. Really clear air for property investors is a difficult thing to do because for the clearest air in real estate, you have to invest uh, circa above the median value of the marketplace. And today in housing, you know, the median value of most of our major capital cities is $800, $900 million. So to find clear air, you've got to, uh, in some respects, invest above that median pricing. So for most property investors, they just simply cannot afford to do it. So they're asked to invest in a volatile space, which is the bottom end of the marketplace. And of course, investing in the bottom end of the marketplace, whether it's urban or regional, carries volatility. And of course, that volatility needs to be understood to find the diamonds in the rough, whether it's in a regional marketplace, a township, uh, a regional town centre, a, a regional city, uh, you need to understand what economics is at play. Now, the main thing to understand about anything in real estate is aggregate demand is what ultimately matters. If the marketplace votes that Brisbane is where the, the smart money is going, and you've invested in Adelaide, uh, no matter what you, uh, your opinion of Adelaide is over Brisbane, if everyone else is invested in Brisbane, Brisbane's going to go up in value. So really the number one rule in real estate is to understand what aggregate demand actually wants. Aggregate demand is effectively the demand of the mass populace within the marketplace. Where are they shopping? And of course, um, again, you can have a really good opinion of a marketplace, but if everyone else has a different opinion and puts their money elsewhere, a marketplace somewhere else will go up in value. Now, over the years, there's been a lot of fads when it comes to where aggregate demand shops. And sometimes aggregate demand can create a short 
love affair with a real estate marketplace with a effectively a city and then realize there's a lack of fundamentals and it all come crashing down. So the trick with understanding aggregate demand is making sure if it's a fad or a fundamental driving why people would invest in a certain place. And uh, again, um, uh, that applies to even urban markets as well as regional marketplaces. But for the most part, urban marketplaces like your big cities, if Sydney's uh, doing well as as an, a, a place of appeal for aggregate demand, then uh, you know it's it's got a lot of fundamentals behind it. It's got a lot of population growth. It's got a lot of jobs. It's got a lot of industries. It's not a one horse town. So when we think about real estate at the moment, we can almost break down uh, a level of economics around what people are actually doing. It's actually a two-tiered real estate marketplace. The first tier is really a economic uh, or economics driven of well-being economics, well-being economics. The second economic principle driving what is going on in real estate today is trickle-down economics, the flight to affordability. So you've got really two marketplaces, the well-being economic marketplace and the trickle-down, I need to get into something or I'm going to be left behind. It's really the two marketplaces which we see in an economic, uh, uh, I guess, uh, con- concept driving the real estate marketplaces. So what is well-being economics? Great question. Uh, it's very prevalent today. Well-being economics is really the idea that millennials and also baby boomers, the two massive cohorts of demographics, any of those people inside those demographics aspire to buying a property in a lifestyle area, a well-being area. And really, off the back of that, you have seen huge amounts of, of demand in both regional and urban well-being areas. And it's one of the reasons why I teach, if you can, if you can um, visualize it, buy in an affordable well-being or livable suburb in uh, an urban area. Just that's because that's what I focus on, because you will get well-being economics. You won't get trickle-down economics. And um, really, trickle-down economics is really the the concept that the best real estate in well-being areas, lifestyle areas, goes up. And really, the bottom eventually goes up by virtue of the fact that uh, the real estate market is in high demand in well-being areas. So you get this kind of... The, the market works its way down. As the better areas disappear, there's this flight to, okay, wow, there's not much left in my price range. I will trickle down and buy something. So high demand areas experience property values increasing and um, obviously that eventually displaces people. And then so you get low demand areas seeing an uplift of, of growth through trickle-down economics is the best way to kind of understand how it kind of works. Now, remember, boomers and millennials are a massive, massive generation or two generations. And wealthy boomers and wealthy millennials value, uh, you know, livable communities, walkable communities, they value easy access to to enjoyable shopping. They act, they love you know beaches. They love lifestyle. They love socialization. They love coffee shops, and off the back of that, you have seen 
uh, some incredible results in regional communities and also you've seen some regional communities now remain much lower than other regional communities in price, probably off the back of uh, the concept of really they're not the first, uh, I guess, place people want to buy if they've got money. Now, I'll just have a sip of water. Uh, hold on, folks. It's early in the morning here and, uh, yeah, my voice box is not really ready for podcasting. But if we, if we consider well-being economics and regional communities, uh, we can say, well, what is actually the most expensive median house value in a regional market today? And you don't have to go past Byron Bay. The average, well, the median house in Byron Bay is circa $1.5 million. Now, that's more expensive than the median house in Sydney, which is sort of circa $1.35 million. So Byron Bay is obviously a well-being mecca and as such has attracted the well-being dollars. It's now priced out anyone who uh, has a limited budget as a property investor. And in fact, if we go through all of some of the big cities and regional areas where there is well-being economics, lifestyle economics at play, you'll, you'll notice a trend. I'll read some statistics out to you. So Byron Bay, as we know, it's a well-being community, 1.5 million. Kayama on the south coast of Sydney, 1.5 million. Kayama is a beautiful little beach place connected to Berry, lots of well-being, lots of food markets, beautiful place. You, you boomers have and millennials have smashed that marketplace. Circa, if you're not familiar with it, you know, it's probably an hour and a half from Sydney, Byron Bay, an hour and a half from the Gold Coast. Then you got Sydney at uh, 1.35 million. Now in Sydney, if you're buying in Sydney, what you're trying to do first, if you can afford it, is find well-being suburbs in Sydney suburbs which have uh, affordable and livable opportunities in them. You're effectively taking the Byron Bay effect and retrofitting it in Sydney before you go to Sydney's trickle-down effect. Uh, if we go to the next one, the Surf Coast, 1.3 million. That's obviously, uh, you know, down in Victoria, uh, just outside Geelong. Again, um, you know, Huge amounts of money people are paying for real estate there because of well-being economics. We go to Noosa, 1.29 million well-being economics. Barrel, uh, 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 basically, a, um, you know, a, a nice sort of uh, regional township of wealthy people who want country estates, 1.14 million well-being economics. If we go to Ballina, you know, sitting off the back of Byron Bay. People are moving there, well-being economics. Kingscliff, again, another coastal marketplace connected within two hours to sort of major urbanism, 1 million and 30,000. If we go to the Sunshine Coast, again, $1 million, well-being economics. People move to the Sunshine Coast for its lifestyle particulates. Uh, then you've got Canberra. Um, $930,000, probably not such a, a well-being marketplace, but ultimately we understand Canberra's full of high-income people connected to the government system. If we drop down one further, the Adelaide Hills, also 930000 median value. Now, the Adelaide Hills is a beautiful part of Adelaide. Again, well-being economics. Newcastle, 890000 well-being economics. Shell Harbour, just below Sydney, uh, 890,000 well-being economics. Lake Macquarie, just above Sydney, about an hour and a half uh, drive, $880,000. Then you go into your uh, big urban markets. Then comes Melbourne at 855 and Brisbane at 845. Two huge marketplaces from a capital preservation point of view, 
excellent marketplaces to make sure you get your money back. But again, if you're going into those marketplaces, you want the affordable lifestyle precincts before you trickle down into basically trickle down economics. So very interesting, right? And then if you start to look at the more affordable uh, trickle down economic marketplaces, which the marketplace aggregate demand has basically overlooked in preference of places like Noosa, the Surf Coast, Kayama, Byron Bay. You've got uh, areas like Cairns, which today is 600-odd thousand, Wagga Wagga, 610,000, Augury, Redonga, 590,000, Fraser Coast, 580,000, Gympie, 580, Darwin, 565. You've got... Um, uh, places like Bundaberg at 520,000, Tamworth 510, uh, Mackay 485, and uh, Gladstone $430,000, Mildura $420,000, as is Rockhampton at $420,000 median value. So, of course, for property investors, they might look at Rockhampton and go, wow, that's really good value at $420,000. Uh, and of course, play with the trickle down marketplace of trickle down economics um, rather than uh, ultimately where aggregate demand is looking, which is those other more expensive marketplaces. Now, in Rockhampton, there's going to be nice streets, there's going to be nice uh, suburbs, there's going to be beautiful houses. I've been to Rockhampton many times, I love the botanical gardens there. There's some beautiful old Queenslander homes that um, would make fantastic property investments in the Rockhampton marketplace. And again, um, I'm sure you could drop a couple of million dollars in Rockhampton and find uh, really a version of well-being economics in Rockhampton. The trick is, and the point of the conversation, is how do we find the well-being pockets of any marketplace. That is really the principle of what we're seeing because if we want really the economics behind wealth, it's what the, the more wealthy in society are wanting. And of course, the rate of capital growth of where the wealthy goes is just higher than the rate of capital growth whereby there is this sort of trickle-down effect around uh you know, that's all people can afford. So they're going somewhere to buy something. And um, so that's the economic principle we need to consider wherever we're investing. And of course, regional marketplaces to me um, sometimes feel a bit urban. Like the Gold Coast to me is considered a regional market, but it's to me, it's an urban place. Newcastle is considered region, regional, but to me, it's a very urban place. So if we were to sort of think about um, types of regional marketplaces, obviously, you've got some very volatile places, ghost towns, you've got mining towns, you've got uh, basically truck stop towns, you've got some pretty small and volatile areas where if you do my four quadrant investment system, capital preservation is is probably the biggest problem in those kind of precincts. Equally, uh, if we were to, to look at different um, concepts of regional areas, you can actually invest in regional areas which are connected to urban areas, and that is known as peri-urban or peri-urbanism. And uh, I'm, I'm a big fan of peri-urban marketplaces. You could argue that, uh, uh, that um, uh, the Adelaide Hills is peri-urban or the Barossa Valley is peri-urban connected to the Adelaide marketplace. It's basically an hour's drive to the city. You get the benefits of the city within literally a commute, um, you're kind of getting the best of both, the best of a rural setting in an urban environment. And again, when it comes to well-being economics, people want 
in some respects, a rural setting in an urban environment. And uh, if you can find those rural settings in an urban environment, you can do very well. You could argue that Barrel is a peri-urban environment. It's, it's not too far from Sydney. Um, it's commutable, but it's rural. And so uh, when it comes to sort of breaking this stuff down, there is some studies which kind of show that there is a distance that the aggregate demand prefers to be when it comes to its distance from the major mothership being the uh, being the urban uh, CBD. So uh, the the distance that is highly highly sought after for people to go regional is around 125 kilometer radius of the mothership. So for Melbourne, it's 125 kilometer radius. For Sydney, it's 125 kilometer radius. For Brisbane, it's 125 kilometer radius. And so uh, Brisbane's a great example. You know, you can live in a regional marketplace in northern New South Wales and you're still about 125 kilometers from Brisbane. I've got people in my own company that live in Kingscliff, effectively, uh, and drive to Brisbane every day. And uh, there are 125 kilometers uh, drive per day one way. And again, they burn through cars. They don't seem to have a problem destroying motor vehicles. But uh, that's really what most people want. And uh, most demographers call it the sort of two-hour city, the idea that um, anything connected to a major, major hub within two hours, which has well-being economics is considered very, very, very viable from a capital growth position as a property investment. So really why people end up going regional is, and there's been a lot of surveys and polls on this, the first one, 73% of people go regional put um, uh, for better lifestyle. It's as simple as that, lifestyle. So if regional offers no lifestyle, it's just trickle-down economics. If it offers lifestyle, it's well-being economics. And so, uh, you know, a lot of people want to be close to the environment, whether it's the surf, whether it's the beach, whether it's a, a regional set, setting. And, of course, a large percentage of people will go regional for affordability. And, again, this is, this is the... The balancing act, right? If an area is just affordable but it's not highly livable and there's no real well-being to the marketplace, is it actually going to work out as a great investment after all? So I like sticking to the migration patterns, right? Um, there's there's well-known pipelines of migration, and if you think about it, you've got your primary city to your secondary feeder city, Sydney to Newcastle. You've got inner city to outer suburbs. So you've got people who live in apartments that will uh, basically have kids and go to the outer suburbs to, to buy a three or four bedroom home. In other words, they'll go from, uh, they'll go from Brunswick to Werribee just because they're starting a family. It's a known migration pattern. You've got uh, really coastal, uh, basically primary cities, places like um, you know Brisbane, which is effectively a port, and you've got its inland feeder city, which is Toowoomba. It's a well-known, well-trodden pipeline of people going actually both ways. And it can work both ways. These are just regular pipelines. You've got uh, people who will go to, in Victoria, because Victoria is a very, very tiny landmass. It's not as big as, say, New South Wales. You've got a lot of successful regional areas which can connect to the city of Melbourne. And uh, you've got... Uh, places like Geelong um, and, uh, and you know, other regional city, cities which are just 
within that sort of two hour maze of 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 activity. And so uh, then you've got obviously um, your your cities where people will leave when they're young and return when they're old. So you will get dynamics like people leaving Hobart and coming to Sydney or people leaving Hobart and and trying out Melbourne. And then you'll get older people in Melbourne thinking uh, Hobart's a great place to downsize. And, of course, you get the suburban to uh, the inner city. You get effectively a migration of that, people leaving suburbia, bored, out of their minds, trying out the inner city lifestyle cafes and culture. And, of course, we know you get the international routes. You know, um, Australian expats who've made a bucket load of money in London returning to Melbourne, that kind of activity. Um, and so we know there's common we know there's common migration patterns. We know periurban is a common migration pattern. We know that if someone in uh, who comes from Adelaide likes the idea of a rural setting, then the Barossa Valleys is only an hour and a half, and you get a well, not even an hour and a half, an hour away, and you get um, a rural setting. So you will get a lifestyle or well-being economic uplift on that marketplace and so you'll also get the same effect coastal people live in Wollongong because they can work in Sydney so regional opportunities again will uh, you'll have to just when you're when you're analyzing your real estate you might want to look at you can now go okay is this trickle down economics that I'm doing here with my investment or am I in the well-being suburb, street, pocket, or is there actually no well-being at all when it comes to the reason as to why someone would live there? It's just basically affordable properties that are affordable properties. And again, there's a big sort of difference as to what aggregate demand is actually looking for. So obviously, all real estate carries risks. Uh, in urban areas, there's lots of risks. In regional areas, there's other risks. And so um, economics is certainly not stat static, right? Things change. Things change all the time. And, uh, you know, everyone listening would understand that. I mean, we lived through a one in 100 year pandemic four years in the making over uh, four years ago. It kicked off. So economics is does not stay still and things change and really um, one of the reasons from a capital preservation point of view I tend to sort of work mainly in urban markets is economics is not static it moves it moves and so I've got to be very mindful in my role to make sure that uh, capital preservation is is a big driver and so um, by way of example, if the Australian government stopped population growth by basically changing the algorithm of how many people come to the country, then there's going to be a uh, there's going to be a change in economics in Australia. Australia's economics is very much population led. Like we put more people into the country to grow the GDP of the country. If those people were not in the country, the GDP of the country wouldn't be as strong as it is. And so you would have effectively a higher unemployment rate because there would just be less activity. Um, and ultimately, you would see probably a bit of a slowdown in marketplaces. And of course... The problem is if the capital cities catch a cold and slow down and go down in value, they become highly prized in value from people from regional marketplaces because of the alpha nature of their value proposition, particularly the lifestyle areas. So the world, if you like, is also... Um, connected to uh, global population shifts. And we know what is happening 
in regional areas, like very regional areas, small country towns in Asian cities. We know what's going on in European cities. They're becoming ghost towns. So in Japan, there's uh, uh, it's, it's called Ikea, which means empty house. And today in Japan, there's something like a million empty homes in regional marketplaces because there isn't an improvement on the population through what we do here as in Australia, which is population economics. So the biggest threat you can have as a property investor is depopulation. It's basically the number one threat to property investment. The other real principle we've got to consider here in Australia is that the world has gone through uh, a couple of, I guess, economic phases. We had the sort of pre-industrial steady state rise of our cities. Then we had the urbanization of our uh, of our cities. We had basically a baby boom, which grew the baby boomers. So we had high fertility um, and then all of a sudden a low mortality rate. So people started to live longer uh, and we had people who, uh, and lots of babies were made. And so today we have that generation still alive known as the baby boomer generation. And so if you think of a pyramid and you twist it upside down, that is the worst situation for an economy. And at the top of the upside-down pyramid is old people, and at the bottom of the upside-down pyramid is young people. Young people obviously go to work and pay taxes. Old people basically are the beneficiary of being old and building society. So what what is ultimately happening is we are basically shrinking in our fertility. We're not having children. And um, uh, people are living older. And so all of a sudden, we, we as a country, the only way to solve that is to bring more people here. But as we know, we're not building enough houses to populate the people we bring. So I'm not a fan of investing where governments can effectively ruin the model. And uh, at some point, one government's going to take power and say, enough is enough. We're not going to have 300,000 people come here a year, 500,000 people come here to prop up this system. So the long and the short of that story is the idea of depopulation. If an urban area has depopulation there uh, though it 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 can cause you know high vacancy rates and things like that you generally you know you, you generally don't feel it as much the bigger the size of the marketplace the less you feel the real estate bumps and bruises if a thousand people leave a township of 50,000 people that marketplace feels it far more than if 10,000 people leave a city of 5 million. And so the risk that is paramount in regional marketplaces is what is ultimately occurring in many places around the world. There's evidence of this right now that those areas which really are trickle-down economic regions of places like Japan are not being refilled with young people who want to live in those areas. And again, um, the reason I kind of highlighted that, that is economics is not static. And so what appears to be a good idea today could turn out to be a really bad idea down the track. And of course, the other big risk to real estate is unemployment. Unemployment. 
And again, like if you change the population model here in Australia, you would probably get a rise in unemployment. And then all of a sudden do industries in certain areas come under stress? Now, the more industries you have in your uh, in your city, the better off you're going to be, the safer you're going to be. And typically, the bigger the city, the more industry. So if one industry closes, there's still surviving industries to give people jobs. In smaller communities, if a factory shuts, uh, you know, it can cause... Uh, it can cause a market to go sideways for a very long time. You know, I uh, had invested in Orange in in New South Wales and, um, uh, you know, Electrolux, which, which, uh, you know, is a manufacturer of, you know, electrical items, basically shut down. You know, 500 people in that town lost their job and it was very somber for a period of time in that regional community. So again, like you've just got to weigh up what the government is basically uh, not talking about. If it's in the news, it's 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 not a risk. If it's not in the news, it's a risk. We just simply don't know what the next move when it comes to uh, a bigger population is here in Australia. So you've just got to be really really mindful. That that is the risk. Now it's less of a risk in a region like Newcastle, where there's seven hundred thousand people. Less of a risk in uh, Geelong, uh, which is basically interconnected with Melbourne, than it is um, Mildura. Right? These are these are the the conversations you've got to have with yourself. And you know, I'm always a believer. There's no right or wrong. There's just the reality of the evidence. And again. Um, that's what's happening around the world. And of course, you've got to also take into consideration in some regional markets, there is a level of fake economics unfolding. Basically, the only reason the towns aren't dead is government props up the town with a government service. So they put a hospital there or some sort of quasi-government department um, and they operate out of the town to help the town basically with its uh, with its economics. There is no real industry. And so you've just got to be mindful some regional towns um, are, are basically almost indig- industry-less and, of course, um, or reliant on one industry and one uh, – and government, basically. And so I call those townships, hospital and hope communities. So obviously there's there's pros to, to investing in, in regional marketplace. And of course, a lot of those pros is some of the prices are fantastic and some of the rent you can get just seem really, really good as well. However, there's some obviously cons to uh, to the 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 regional world, you know, some of it around economic vulnerability, which I've spoken about, some of it around lack of infrastructure investment, some of it around market liquidity. Some regional areas are just more prone to natural disasters at the moment. We know Lismore, for example, is is basically being bought back off the federal government because it's just too risk prone to natural disasters like um, flooding, we know regional areas can have liquidity issues. So when uh, the market goes to sleep, and, and, and right now the market isn't asleep, but eventually it goes to sleep. And the problem is it can take a year to sell a property in a regional community, um, not 30 days like in an urban community. So capital preservation, if you need to get your money out quickly, becomes a real problem sometimes in illiquid regional marketplaces. And in some respects, you do also encounter a limited level of professional services in in certain regional communities, which adds layers of cost to your investment. Uh, It can mean, 
you know, you pay more for property management, you pay more for repairs. Uh, if you have to replace goods, white goods, electrics, it just costs a little bit more because obviously regional Australia has a higher um, level of sort of inflation than in the cities where there's basically more competition with people pushing prices down when it comes to consumables. So obviously worst case is population decline. That would be the worst case. But certainly, um, you know, some pros are things like obviously it's affordable at, um, and and certainly from an entry level point of view, you know, you typically can buy, you know, a, a home on a big block of land and, um, you know, get yourself um, an entry level property. Um Demographically speaking, you do not get the rental cohorts like you do in um, in cities, where you get sort of quite often, you know, high paying, um, you know, I guess office workers, Manhattan effect workers that basically can pay, you know, th- bucket loads of rent. But equally, there are some good short stay strategies in regional marketplaces. So plenty of pros and cons. Probably the considerations you need to really think about is I call it the 10,000 person rule. Like don't invest in a town below 10,000. Um, really, I think, you know, you want sort of 50,000 at a bare ass minimum. Um, you know, it just, it's very volatile um, the lower the amount of people you go. And there's been situations where banks have basically vetoed lending high loan-to-value ratios in populaces below 10,000 people. So just be very, very wary of going to uh, regional Australia with, uh, you know, which is outside that two-hour drive concept of cities that has a low amount of people living in the township. Um, obviously when you resell, there's typically less competition as well. So you've just got to be mindful that these are some of the considerations, you know, why you see 90 people at an auction in, in a wellbeing part of Sydney on a weekend paying $500,000 more than what the property is worth is because of competition, because of competition, aggregate demand, what they want. So regional areas though can be good. And again, I'm I'm even though I'm the urban property investor, um, and I identify as an urban property investor, I'm gonna come out of the closet. I've been a regional property investor too. I've done a lot of regional work. I've got the lashes on the back from going way too regional. But equally, I've got properties today in what are identified and classified as regional marketplaces. And so I believe there is a level of evidence you need to satisfy yourself when it comes to uh, the different types of industry effectively in regional marketplaces. So factual evidence. So what I like to see in regional, I'm going to go through them. I like to see an airport. I want to know I can get a plane from that marketplace to a major city. And if you look at places like Byron Bay and Ballina, they've done really, really well, but they also have an airport effectively. So factual evidence of an airport, Port Macquarie, it's got an airport. Um, And again, like if you can move by plane, it gets a lot of ticks for me. The second one I think makes a big difference to a regional community is a university, a university. Uh, Toowoomba has got a great university. In New England, you've got, um, you know, Armidale University, um, you know, Newcastle, you've got a massive university. A university is a massive, massive um, uh, uh, good thing for a regional area. Obviously, um, you want a local media um, in the town. You want, if you can get it, um, some government like military or the CSIRO. Um, Obviously, the Hospital and Hope 
um, concept is paramount to a regional area. Uh, Newcastle, John Hunter Hospital, massive employment uh, concept. Um, if you can get national events in your regional town or regional city, makes a lot of sense to me. National events is are people coming there for a reason? Is there activities happening? Private schools, are there boarding schools in those regional areas? Do does the uh, does the wealthy uh, marketplace send their kids to school there? Or at a local level, is there actually schooling options to have private schools in those uh, those communities? This is a massive tick for a regional town for me. Obviously, uh, a broad range of housing from aged care, so people um, you know know that they can live in those towns their entire life, to um, you know different types of uh, architecture within the uh, township. Does it have different period homes, new homes, old homes, um, falling down homes? Like, is there a level of growth happening? and building activity happening in the township. Um, is there a lot of local businesses and a lot of entrepreneurs that are in the township? Is there a thriving retail in the township? Do you walk down the town and every fourth shop is basically uh, just about to go out of business and, um, you know, starting to look pretty pretty sad and sleepy? That's not a good signal, not a good signal. You want a thriving retail community full of businesses and entrepreneurs that uh, that work. And, of course, if you can get a beautiful cafe culture, that ticks the box as well. Obviously, government's going to be in those areas as, as part of basically them propping up basically those marketplaces. But then we want some industry. We want some industry. And we don't want one single industry. Like if you can get three or four connected to a regional marketplace, that's kind of your bare ass minimum if you ask me. Um, and again, uh, it could be a mixture of agriculture, construction. Uh, it could be a mixture of tourism. Um, some elements that protect the marketplace if one industry was to really, really have it tough. And really, you've got to ask yourself with the regional towns, like, what next? What's the next for investment and development of that town? What's next for the growth of education? Is it a stagnant education environment? Is it struggling schools or is it thriving schools, growing, buying more land, putting more schooling facilities around their schools? What next is happening? What next for health is the... Uh, is the, the, the hospital expanding its offering in that marketplace? Is it growing? Because if the hospital's growing, it means the catchment of people is also growing. Is the retail growing? Is there, is there people moving in and gentrifying uh, those regional areas? Are they becoming even, in some respects, cooler than some of the most hip urban pockets about? Uh, what next for economic development? What industries are going to innovate? And again, like we are living in a VUCA world, very volatile at times. And uh, again, maybe there's some new innovating industries which are going to help develop that region to be a successful region into the future. And of course, what next for uh, basically well-being? What next for arts, culture? What next for... Uh, community, what next for people? Well-being is a primary driver as to why people would choose a regional marketplace. And what next for technology and innovation? What What's going to happen in that space? Um, what uh, is going to grow in and around that community? And really, I think you've got to always consider a compared to what from a, even from a global level, like uh, what next for the vision of this town? What is the compared to what? 
And, you know, you could look at the success of a regional place like the Gold Coast, which um, is effectively a uh, regional pocket of Australia, but it's been very, very successful off effectively um, well-being economics. And then you go, well, what is the com- global comparison? You, you know, you could look at Miami. Um, it's an absolute compared to what. And again, like if, if you think about your, the town you're um, perhaps investing in, most cities usually, usually or towns have a sister city. You can look at the compared to what as to what, um, you know, that that city thinks of itself at a global level. Just look for their sister city and, and check out what they think they are. Um, you can, um, you know, there's evidence that a city of that size working elsewhere, it's a good level of, of reason to consider those areas as a prime investment place. But you've got to think about where will the pressure come from? Will aggregate demand come to this marketplace or is it really a trickle-down marketplace? Is it going to be driven off future zoning? Is it going to be driven off basically old people looking to retire somewhere? Is it going to be driven off young families coming to really enhance the community as much as anything else? And how will the city cope with that pressure is really a, an interesting part of the puzzle. Um, but look, I find with any investment, whether it's, uh, whether it's in, in, in any place, you want the Forex growth plan. You want to know you're buying well, good part of town, uh, you know, solid marketplace that is full of reasons people want to grow that marketplace and a differentiator on the property you know, we want assets where the long-term trend is demand will outstrip supply. We do want a level of good population growth, infrastructure growth and employment growth. We want our rents to double. So we need to consider and factor that the precinct where we're buying in, whether it's urban or regional, does it have the ability for rents to go up over time? Is there demand pushing those rents? And where is that demand coming from? Is it just market demand putting pressure on people who can't afford to actually pay the rent? Or is it actually a socioeconomic level of demand whereby the person living there has plenty of money and your job as a property investor is to scrape that money from that person through really the idea of being a property owner? And of course, look, humans, they always have demand for better places. That's human nature. Better places equals more uh, more capital growth and ultimately more rental growth. And of course, in every town, and I've probably offended every regional community in Australia, but I know there's always a dress circle in every town and it will no doubt be worth investing in as long as the town is of a reasonable size. Um you know, uh, I, was, I was just in Alice Springs. It's a township of 20,000 people. Would I be th- throwing my retirement in Alice Springs? I'm, I'm probably not going to do it. Just to chase affordability. There's some great affordable properties in Alice Springs. Just don't, just don't see it. Don't know the vision. Don't know the future. Don't see it. Uh, do I see a vision and future in urban areas? It's going to happen, right? Um, do I see a vision and future in two hour radius of our big cities? Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, are there outlier regional communities, which, you know, basically are contrarian to the two hour rule? There is, there's, there's a couple of them, but equally there are others which are just now focus of property investors because that's the flight to affordability, the trickle down effect again, um, you know, what happens is you might see uh, other marketplaces adjust and become better value. And then you're, you know, you can get stuck in the wrong um, area. My advice is think of real estate as a, a game of building a portfolio. Diversify a little bit, get your assets around the country, um, explore urban areas, um, you know, 
buy some some feeder areas and uh, you'll 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 have a nice diverse portfolio that grows over time. All right, folks, I hope that was interesting. Please leave a review. I shall leave you be now. All the best. Cheerio. Thanks for tuning in to the Urban Property Investor. To never miss an episode, make sure you subscribe to the podcast on your favorite app or on YouTube. And I would love it if you could give the show a rating and share it with your friends and family. In between episodes, you can always keep in touch with me by connecting on social media over Facebook, Instagram, or LinkedIn. Until we meet again on the next episode of the Urban Property Investor, take care and bye for now.